Donald Trump's historic arrest and Tennessee Republicans political retaliation. We cannot and will not normalize serious criminal conduct. The criminal is the district attorney. Former President Donald Trump is charged with 34 felony counts, becoming the first commander in chief in history to be indicted. This is election interference. His allies rushed to his defense. We are just not going to comment. We're not going to interfere. While the White House chooses not to engage. Plus, we called for you all to ban assault weapons, and you respond with an assault on democracy. Republican lawmakers in Tennessee take extraordinary steps against their Democratic colleagues following the deadliest school shooting in the state's history. Next. This is Washington Week. Corporate funding is provided by... For 25 years, Consumer Cellular's goal has been to provide wireless service that helps people communicate and connect. We offer a variety of no-contract plans, and our U.S.-based customer service team can help find one that fits you. To learn more, visit ConsumerCellular.tv. Additional funding is provided by... Koo and Patricia Ewens with the Ewan Foundation, committed to bridging cultural differences in our communities. Sandra and Carl DeLay Magnuson. Rose Herschel and Andy Shreves. Robert and Susan Rosenbaum. The Corporation for Public Broadcasting. And by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Washington Week. I'm Jeff Bennett. History was made in New York City this week when, for the first time in our nation's history, a former American president was indicted, arrested, and arraigned on criminal charges. Former President Donald Trump was charged in a Manhattan courtroom Tuesday with 34 felony counts for allegedly falsifying business records in a hush money scheme during the 2016 election. He pleaded not guilty to all charges. After Mr. Trump's arraignment, Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg emphasized the seriousness of the charges. True and accurate business records are important everywhere, to be sure. They are all the more important in Manhattan, the financial center of the world. But that night, Mr. Trump responded in a defiant and embittered speech at Mar-a-Lago, his Florida home, criticizing the case and its presiding judge, Juan Mershon. This fake case was brought only to interfere with the upcoming 2024 election. I have a Trump-hating judge with a Trump-hating wife and family. Judge Mershon and his family have received dozens of violent threats since the arraignment. The Biden White House has largely avoided commenting on the active case, but White House spokesperson Corrine Jean-Pierre responded to news of those threats. I'm not going to speak to uh, an ongoing uh, case. We condemn any type of uh, attacks on any judge. Joining us to talk about this and more, Jacqueline Alamany, congressional invest investigations reporter for The Washington Post, Peter Baker, chief White House correspondent for The New York Times, Francesca Chambers, White House correspondent for USA Today, and Hugo Lowell, reporter at The Guardian. With a thanks to all of you for being with us, let's start our conversation tonight where we started this historic week. Donald Trump pleading not guilty on Tuesday to 34 felony counts of falsifying business records in the first degree. Jackie, if this case goes to trial, it likely won't happen until the new year. What happens between then and now in this case? And how is the Trump team preparing? Very good question, Jeff. There are sort of two prongs to uh, this answer. There is the process part of it and then sort of the, the political strategy part of it. From a process perspective, as uh, Hugo and I both heard in the courtroom in New York this week, uh, during the actual arraignment, prosecutors sort of laid out a schedule. Uh, Trump and his lawyers and the prosecution need to come to an agreement on a protective order that was laid out um, during the arraignment. So that needs to be set before really anything else can happen that has not yet been agreed to. From there, uh, there's going to be different stages of the discovery that prosecutors also laid out. Um, that's going to take up to uh, a week, depending on when the protective orders agreed to, and then up to 65 days. And then by the end of August, uh, potentially Trump's legal team will have all of the discovery uh, that Alvin Bragg's team has put together. Uh, and then by the end of the year, maybe we will see them in court again for sort of a, a conference. But as you noted, we are not going 
going to see them all together back in that courtroom uh, in New York on trial until potentially spring 2024, as uh, Todd Blanche, Trump's newest lawyer, asked for uh, Judge Marchand on Tuesday. Yeah. And, and Hugo, if you read the indictment's statement of facts, the DA's office seems to have the, the payments pretty well documented. But New York law says that prosecutors have to prove it was part of another crime in order to bump that misdemeanor up to a felony. And the charging documents don't specify which laws Mr. Trump allegedly broke. And Alvin Bragg is basically saying, I don't have to show my cards. Right. You know, under New York law, Alvin Bragg doesn't have to lay out the particulars. That comes in the Bill of Particulars, and that's why in the Statement of Facts you basically get the narrative. And it seems to be the kind of information that they got in the grand jury investigative phase. And the key question is going to be, what is that second crime? And there seem to be multiple paths that were laid out there. One was, of course, the, the hush money payments and the camp potential campaign finance violations. The second, tantalizingly, was this element about uh, you know, mischaracterizing the payments for tax purposes. And then the third was about filing these sorts of documents to uh, other entities, potentially to the FEC, potentially to other government entities. And so I think there are multiple paths that were laid out, all of them pretty chargeable. I mean, there's a lot of discussion about whether you can have a state prosecutor use a federal crime in conjunction with an underlying state crime. And under New York law, that seems to be pretty permissible. Hmm. And, and Peter, there are two ways, I think, to read former President Trump's reaction to all of this, his furious reaction. One, it sort of fuels his particular brand of, of grievance politics. On the one hand, it's not all that surprising. But on the other hand, it could be read as him um, acknowledging his vulnerability, not just in Manhattan, but the three other ongoing cases. Well, that's the thing, exactly. If this were the last thing we were going to see as a legal challenge to President, former President Trump, that would be one thing, because people will make their judgments about it. They say they won't see a trial until next year, and they may decide, well, it's tawdry, it's not all that uh, pretty a picture, but on the other hand, is it disqualifying for a president? We went through this 25 years ago, by the way, with Bill Clinton. We had the exact, very similar conversation about whether lying about sex in an official proceeding is disqualifying for a president or not. Republicans and Democrats have different views today than they once did. But it's not the last thing we're going to see. We're going to see an, uh, some sort of resolution, if not an indictment, from three other cases. And when you start to build them up, one after the other after the other, and you have all these other legal issues he's got, he's going on trial for, for what amounts to rape in three weeks with uh, E. Jean Carroll's uh, a lawsuit in the civil court in New York. And he's got another uh, civil case from Letitia James in New York State Attorney General. He is going to be in a courtroom, or his lawyers will, all year long. And it's going to be uh, the cumulative effect of that we don't know. Wow. But Francesca, in the meantime, former President Trump's goal seems to be crystal clear, which is to turn his legal problems into political gain. And he has raised quite a bit of money off of this so far. But when you look at the rest of the expected Republican field or current Republican field, they're banking on exactly what Peter just said, is that the cumulative effect of all this will start to wear down his numbers. So while you're seeing a jump now in his numbers and his popularity, that you'll see that that dip back down. But as, as you were saying, the, the question really remains as to whether one of them can also break out in that sort of environment and permanently uh, beat him in this race. Yeah. Who can take us behind the, the curtain of Trump world? How are they really feeling about this beyond, beyond the spin and the bluster? Well, I think that actually Trump's performance on Tuesday night at Mar-a-Lago after the arraignment was pretty telling. At the top of his mind, what he kept going back to was the classified documents case. Uh, it wasn't, you know, he did attack Bragg. He attacked Judge Marchand uh, in violation of that protective order and of the warning that the judge, uh, not of the protective order, but the warning that the judge had given to him that day, saying you really need to tamp down the rhetoric out of concern for, you know, the safety of the officials involved in these proceedings and also um, uh, for him, for Judge Marchand. Um, but he was fixated on the classified documents uh, case as well. And, and so I think that is, is fairly telling that there are, as, as Peter just laid out, a number of, of um, potential avenues for criminal exposure down the line that have potentially more grave consequences than what he's facing in New York. And even just looking at his face in that courtroom, I was in the overflow room, so I didn't see him firsthand, but you could see the uh, live stream of him. And he was uh, downcast, dour, uh, and, and did not look like someone, despite a lot of the bravado and fundraising 
raising appeals who wanted to be there. Yeah, and, and Hugo, to Jackie's point, I mean, legal analysts have always said that the, the mishandling of the classified documents, if you're going to compare the cases, that one is more of a slam dunk. Yeah, I think that, look, I think the documents case is complicated, right, because you have the espionage elements and then you have the obstruction elements. And actually, I think a lot of the recent reporting seems to suggest that the special counsel is looking towards an espionage act charge. You know, all these questions to witnesses in the grand jury about, you know, what were the kinds of documents that, you know, you, you know Trump was, you know, throwing around, you know, was, was there stuff about uh, Miller, the, the Joint Chiefs, the former Joint Chiefs of Staff, um, was there stuff about like maps that he was showing to donors? Those seem, those are the kinds of questions that strike me you would ask if you were trying to construct an espionage case. And I think the espionage case comes in conjunction with the obstruction case. I don't think you can do one without the other because to, to basically say Trump willfully retained documents and to prove that willfulness, the easiest way to do that is to say, well, he obstructed the investigation and there you go, that's the willfulness. Yeah. Uh, Peter, the New York case strikes me, the thing that makes that case difficult is that prosecutors have to prove intent, which is notoriously hard to do. Ask anybody who was involved in the John Edwards case, uh, of which he was acquitted, uh, about that. What do you see as the historical analog there between um, that case and the, and the Trump case? Well, that's an interesting case. So John Edwards, of course, was a United States senator, ran for uh, president and was on the vice presidential ticket, and he covered up, in effect, an affair with, uh, with money that was then construed by lawyers as, a, as an illegal campaign or an unreported campaign contribution, went to trial, was acquitted on one charge, there was a hung jury on the others, the prosecutors took away from that a lesson that this doesn't work because it's a kind of novel definition that hush money counts as campaign you know, contribution, right? We hadn't really thought of it that way in the past, and that was a new way of looking at it. Now, a lot of people are saying that means this, this one is in trouble for the same reason, that the, the, the logic may not work. I think it's a little different. First of all, the judge in that case, in the Edwards case, did let it go to trial. Okay, and it was the jury that decided, okay, we're not sure about this particular case, but they weren't judging on the law. The jurors were judging the facts that they were presented with. The, the jurors in this case, assuming the judge lets it go to trial, are going to judge the facts as they're presented. And the facts are pretty remarkable. We've known these now for six or seven years, right, because the reporting in the Wall Street Journal others gave us a lot of this in advance. Michael Cohen told a lot, a lot of this in advance. But if you were to read the statement of facts for the first time, if you had never seen this before, it's a remarkably powerful recitation of the evidence there. And I think the, the, the intent comes through pretty clearly that he wants to cover this up before an election. And that is, you know, that's at the heart of the case. Are you trying to taint an election hmm. by preventing the public from having information that they otherwise would have? Yeah. Francesca, one criminal prosecution is onerous enough. Trump hasn't been charged in any of the, the other cases, and we should say he's innocent until proven guilty in the New York case. But they are facing this multi-front defense across multiple cases, and it further disrupts his ability to dictate his political schedule and really control his own political destiny. That is what a political candidate does not want, this sort of lack of control. But it's complicating the entire field's ability to dictate the schedule as well. You had Asa Hutchinson announce his presidential bid, and you saw him try to get in there right before Trump was indicted. Uh, and then he has his formal announcement later in the month. And I think that's a challenge that's facing the entire GOP field, but also President Joe Biden as well, as he tries to figure out when he should get in uh, get in this race as well. And you have any numbers you're, you're talking about of court cases that, that could come up so it makes the entire election cycle unpredictable it's that unpredictability though that again is giving opponents of the former president this sense of uh, an opportunity here where they might just be able to, to sneak by him let's talk about the republican reaction because republican lawmakers to include mitt romney who twice voted for impeachment uh in various different ways are coming to donald trump's defense only asa hutchinson who you mentioned uh suggested that he should Step, step down, get out of the presidential race now that he's under indictment. Well, the difficulty for them is that when you have Donald Trump, who's taking up so much of the oxygen in the GOP field, it's very evident that you need to win Trump's voters in order to be able to win the GOP primary. And so what they are trying to do is both win his win over his, his voters while differentiating themselves. And I've heard from a number of campaigns that they believe that there will be a favorable contrast drawn between their own candidates and also between President Biden and what's going on right now as well. Peter, for Republicans who are looking to break away from Donald Trump, a number of them say that privately, the former president keeps giving Republicans off-ramp after off-ramp yeah. after off-ramp, unintentionally so. Yeah. 
and yet the party's not taking any of these exits. No, no, they really haven't, right? They haven't from the beginning. I mean, they didn't after Access Hollywood, they didn't after Charlottesville, they didn't after January 6th, they didn't after last year's midterms when everybody most recently thought, well, that's it for him, he's done. They don't want to do it for all the reasons Francesca has said. They're afraid of his voters or they want or covet his voters or think they cannot succeed without his voters. So their logic comes down to what Mitch McConnell was quoted saying by my colleagues, John Martin and Alex Burns in their book last year saying, we're going to let the Democrats take care of him for us. He was talking about that in the context of the second impeachment. But broadly speaking, that's their thought right now. We're going to let the Democrats slash prosecutors slash Justice Department slash judges take care of him for us. We won't have to do it. Hugo, one more potential problem for Donald Trump. We learned this week that former Vice President Mike Pence will not appeal a judge's ruling that orders him to testify before a grand jury in connection to the January 6th investigation. What kind of story would Mike Pence, the, the former VP, be able to give this grand jury? You know, I think, you know, overall, this is a win for the special counsel. He gets Pence in the grand jury. And Pence can testify to the entirety of November through to January 6th. And he was there. He saw a lot. He had a lot of discussions with a lot of people. Um, but I'm actually more of a skeptic about the order than I think other people, because there is a speech or debate clause protection that was baked in, in that order. And if that is basically going to cover him for all of his preparations as president of the Senate on January 6th, well, then that would include his discussions about, you know, what sort of electors he could, you know, throw out on while he's presiding as president of the Senate. Those discussions at the White House December 21 with the Republican members of Congress, the discussions he had with Trump on January 5 and January 6 about how he was going to preside. Those are the black holes that the January 6 committee never actually managed to fill because they couldn't get Pence in, they couldn't get the members in. And it doesn't strike me that the special counsel is going to be able to get those either because Pence will just claim speech or debate. Yeah. And here again, history made this past week. Never before in American history has a vice president been summoned to appear in court to testify uh, about the president with whom he, he served. What does your reporting suggest the impact of this might be? Yeah, I was actually joking with some of Trump's legal team that last week would have been, or this past week, geez. Uh, would have, <laughs> All the days were blending together. Would have been yeah. a great time for Pence to have snuck in and testified before the grand jury with um, little fanfare. Uh, but I do tend to agree with Hugo here that it is um, sort of a, a performative win for the special counsel's office, but we'll see how much information and how helpful he can be. And at the end of the day, he already had some of his top advisors, people like Mark Short, Greg Jacob, uh, testify to the committee, and they've been dealing with the special counsel's office as well and have given uh, up as all the information they have with regards to Trump's efforts to overturn the results of the election. Let's talk about how the White House is handling this, because, Peter, you wrote a piece for The Times recently, and the headline caught my eye. Biden has the Oval Office, but Trump has the center stage. And I would say the White House seems to be perfectly fine with that. President Biden is not trying to compete for attention uh, with the former president who's brought up on criminal charges. Yeah, it's the old saying, of course, when your opponent is busy, uh, you know, shooting himself, don't get in the way. And they don't want to get in the way. And they want this next election to be, if it's Trump's going to run, they want it to be a rerun of 2020 in which Tr Biden may not be your favorite guy. You might not be happy about inflation or Afghanistan or all the other different issues that people are unhappy with him about, but he's not Trump. And so the more that Trump is out there literally, you know, getting his fingerprints taken uh, and appearing in courtrooms, they're going to let that uh, stand. You played the tape of Karine Jean-Pierre. They're not going to comment. They don't want to look like they are, uh, you know, doing what Trump says they are doing, which is orchestrating this. Um, but they're not going to try to compete either because it's just not going to work anyway. Yeah. Literally, the White House press briefing started on time that day <laughs> when Trump's <laughs> indictment happened. Um, they, they, so to your point, um, maybe not even trying, maybe not even trying to compete at all that, that day with a split screen. Uh, but when it comes to the White House, they say that he's just going to continue to focus on his agenda. And they do believe that that benefits, that benefits him here, both when it comes to comparing himself to the former president of the United States, but also what's going on with the GOP in Congress, where now you see them zeroing in on this Manhattan and district attorney and spending their time focused on this as well. Well, let's turn now to the extraordinary moves by the Tennessee's House Republicans who voted to expel two of their black Democratic colleagues, you see them there, from the State House this week for breaking decorum and floor rules. That vote came after congressmen, or rather representatives, Justin Jones, Gloria Johnson, 
and Justin Pearson joined gun safety demonstrations from the Tennessee House floor days after the Nashville Elementary School shooting. On Thursday, Republicans expelled Jones and Pearson, but Johnson survived the expulsion efforts by one vote. It's the latest and most high-profile example of Republicans in red states taking extraordinary steps to exert control over Democrats in elected positions. Peter, what's the potential for all of this to backfire on Republicans? We, we've seen how the electorate has responded to perceived overreach, radicalism, extremism in the 2018 midterms, the 2020 election, and the 2022 midterms. Yeah, I covered a state legislature for years before coming back to Washington, and, and it's, it's, you're seeing Washington now trickle down into the states, right? The sort of the polarization, the anger, the partisanship, the performative sense of outrage is all now translating itself in, in, in state capitals, where it didn't really used to exist. I mean, there was always partisanship, but not, not like this. But the problem or the, the risk for Republicans here is, of course, that, w that when they're in charge, fine, they can kick somebody out. Decorum ought to be maintained on some level. You can understand how any legislative body needs to do that. But to actually kick somebody out altogether for that means that you could be kicked out yourself, right? What happened in Congress when the President of the United States gave a State of the Union just not that long ago? People were shouting at him and calling him a liar on the floor. That's a break of decorum. Do those Republicans get expelled from Congress as a result? I mean, this is really is one of these slippery slopes where you begin to, to, to cause yourself some real problems. And, and the White House is, is really picking its targets here because, as we said, the White House has said really nothing about the Trump situation. Mm -hmm. But President Biden tweeted this. He said, three kids and three officials gunned down in yet another mass shooting. And what are GOP officials focused on? punishing lawmakers who joined thousands of peaceful protesters calling for action. It's shocking, undemocratic, and without precedent. Today, the White House uh, said that President Biden met remotely with those three lawmakers. And of course, we know that Vice President, you see the picture there, mm -hmm. uh, Vice President Kamala Harris is in the ground, on the ground right now in Tennessee meeting with them uh, in person. It looks like the White House is trying to align itself, Francesca, with the, with the energy among those who are advocating for, for greater gun safety. But it's like, also sought to elevate the issue at a time when, because of congressional gridlock, the White House hasn't been able to do more on this issue. And with regards to the vice president going down, you know, this really marries two issues the White House has sought to focus on, both gun reforms, but also to better engage young black men. And the vice president in particular has been putting in a lot of work on that front. And I think that that is a, a very important point about what she did today. Also. And that's why she went to Fisk. And, that's, and that is why she went to Fisk, historically which is as historically college, yeah. Black College and University. All right. Well, at the end of this historic week, as we said, I thought it would be instructive to do a, a quick lightning round and for each of you to, to give us either your prevailing thought or a really interesting piece of reporting that you happened upon this week. And we'll start with Hugo. I really just want to come back to the to Trump's appearance in court because it was so striking and kind of Jackie touched on this earlier. But I did have a pretty good view of Trump walking in and walking out. I was the last one in the courtroom because I was late to the line. Um, but I could see his facial features very clearly. And I had been in that courtroom before when Steve Bannon was arraigned in the We Build the Walk scheme. It's a very bleak courtroom. It has kind of white walls. You know, typically federal court has these big portraits on the wall and like, you know, it's very colorful. It's very kind of ornate. And this was very bleak, and I don't know if that made his facial features look worse, but he came across as very unflattering. And he came across really as looking afraid in a way that I'd never seen him before. Mm. And it was kind of disguised by the sense of indignation, but it was a really striking moment, I think, for Trump, you know, to be finally hit with the sense that he was a criminal defendant. Yeah. We've got about a minute left. Who's next? <laughs> I'll go. I'll, I'll go. The, so the GOP is facing a huge identity crisis right now, and they're having to choose between some of this old school politics, uh, the fiscal conservatism, if you will, that you're hearing Asa Hutchinson and Chris Sununu and others talk about, and also this. And you interviewed this, Chris Sununu this past week. Yes, and also Asa and also Asa oh, Hutchinson, right. and so they're facing this crisis between between that and sort of the things that you see the cultural flashpoints like the Ron DeSantis's focus on, and now we're seeing those play out nationally for the first time. And it will be very curious to see in this election cycle if the GOP potentially um, 
mistrategized on those mm. social issues. Yeah, J Jackie, what are you, what are you w watching for as this New York case in particular comes together? Yeah, well, I, I don't want to give away any potential scoops, uh, <laughs> so I will pivot back to my daily beat congressional investigations. Uh, definitely looking at Jim Jordan, the Judiciary Committee, the Weaponization Committee, and the House Oversight Committee, and how they continue to beat the drum on uh, attacking Alvin Bragg and his team. They just issued another records request a few hours ago to Matthew Colangelo, someone who's actively working on the case for Alvin Bragg. They issued a subpoena for Mark Pomerantz yesterday. Uh, curious to see how Pomerantz responds. I don't think he responded today. Uh, he was advised by the general counsel for Bragg's office not to cooperate with um, Jim Jordan's investigation into uh, the indictment, but we'll be keeping a close eye on that next week. And Peter Baker, we are out of time, but you are <laughs> oh. White House correspondent without peer. So if you tweet it, we can all go to your Twitter account and, and that see works it. works for me. Yeah. Yeah, no, <laughs> Francesca you. Chambers, Peter Baker, Hugo Lowell, Jackie Alemany. A huge thanks to the four of you for being with us. So we will leave it there for now. Thanks to my panel for joining us on this evening. And thanks to all of you for being with us as well. Don't forget to watch PBS News Weekend on Saturday for a look at some of the efforts used by lawmakers and activists in states like Kansas to limit access to abortion. I'm Jeff Bennett. Good night from Washington. Corporate funding for Washington Week is provided by... For 25 years, Consumer Cellular has been offering no-contract wireless plans designed to help people do more of what they like. Our U.S.-based customer service team can help find a plan that fits you. To learn more, visit ConsumerCellular.tv. Additional funding is provided by... Ku and Patricia Ewan through the Ewan Foundation committed to bridging cultural differences in our communities. Sandra and Carl DeLay Magnuson, Rose Herschel and Andy Shreves, Robert and Susan Rosenbaum, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you.